Wait, Hi, uh, my name is Boniface. This is Jeremiah, and this is Olivier, and this is Dilux. We're with my brother's keeper. Uh, we're just gonna let you go ahead and introduce yourself. Hi, buenas tardes, everybody. I'm Susana Davis, and I'm the racial equity director for the state of Vermont. Sweet. Uh, so, I guess to kind of uh, start, what is uh, what is that mean? Your what is your job? Yeah, so, you know, this is a new, well, it's not new. They created this position about four years ago now, but um, I, I was the first person appointed to the position. So no one really knows what it means because we're all just gonna make what we want out of it. And I think there's a lot of real opportunity and possibility with that because it is the first time we have this role. So some of the things that I'm required to do are outlined in the statute that created it. And that statute is Act 9 of 2018. And so some of the duties for this position are to serve as a liaison between the governor's cabinet and the Workforce Diversity Council and the Human Rights Commission. Also creating and delivering trainings for the state and creating um, performance targets and goals. So being able to say, for example, we want to hire 5% more people of color by the year, blah, blah, blah. Um, some other duties include working with different committees and working groups, and they keep adding new stuff every year, which is actually really exciting because what it means is that equity has to be a foundational part of state government. So this work should be showing up in everybody's work. And so that's what we're seeing is more equity work in criminal justice and health and education and all those things. So that's a little bit of what the job means. Uh, I guess just as a summary, I serve as an advisor to the governor on matters related to racial equity and also interact with the public as well and other people in state government to make sure they have all the info that they need and all the services that they need. Sweet. Um... So since uh, since you just like kind of started working like pretty much just like right now, uh, why uh, why is that? Why is it taking this long to get started in your position? And like, what's the how is it any different before you started working? You know, um, part of the reason that it takes a long time. It well, I told you they passed this law in the summer of 2018 but they didn't hire me until the summer of 2019. So it took a whole year just to hire somebody. Um, and it feels like the work has been very slow. I think that's just me being impatient. We didn't get here overnight and we're not gonna fix this overnight. Um, but another thing that happened is six months after I started working in this job, COVID hit. And it just felt like everything was emergency response, pandemic response, and a lot of the policy things we wanted to do on racial equity had to get put on hold because instead we were doing emergency response. I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, we were about to start an MWBE program. That's a program for minority and women-owned business enterprises. Uh, that was something that we put on hold because we were just trying to get small businesses to survive the pandemic um, before we could start thinking about flourishing and building out. Another example is um, one of the things that I wanted to do was a local level program to get towns more invested in equity work. And we also had to put that on hold, but I'm really, really proud to say that um, it got green lighted recently by the governor. And so we put that in our budget and with any luck, I'm hoping that in a few months we can roll it out and, and get started with that work. And you know what, I'm sorry, I have to add on to this answer because I just remembered I didn't really answer the question. Um, some of the things, those are some of the reasons for, for delays, but honestly, a lot of it is just getting to know people and getting people to understand why equity matters in Vermont. Some people think that there aren't that many people of color, so does it really matter? It does matter. And so part of the work is just really educating people. 
Um, do you think that um, since you guys started before, um, you said before the pandemic, right? Was it before the pandemic or through the pandemic? Have you guys like improved a lot or just like the same thing as, as the beginning? I do think we've improved, but I think we have a long way to go. I mean, for example, one of the big things is language access. And we've been talking about that since I started, since before I started. Um, the pandemic definitely forced us to come up with solutions fast because lives depended on it. So I do think that we learned a lot in a really short time and we do things now better. Um, and I, I People don't need it explained to them as much anymore. They get it. So yeah, I, I think we've um, we've improved. Another big thing is we started doing these equity impact assessments, which is basically a long questionnaire. Anytime you have a new idea for budget or policy, you have to do this questionnaire. And the questionnaire asks you things to make sure you're really considering historically marginalized communities. So I'll give you an example. One of the questions on the questionnaire is, Oh, you're making a new program. That's great. Are you going to have public facing documents? If you are, are you translating them? If you are, into what languages? And if you're not, then why not? And those are the kinds of questions that a lot of people in state government have not been used to having to ask. But now that we require this form, it's the kind of thing that becomes second nature because we're doing it every single time. So I think that's one of the ways that we've also improved since then. My question is, I just gonna ask that, does the program only exist in Vermont or these other states? Can you say that one more time, just a little bit louder? Yeah, I was just asking that, does the, uh, the job that you do, is it only exists in Vermont or other states that have somebody does a job? Yeah, you know, a lot of places, a lot of states and cities and counties actually have, have jobs like mine. Um, but you know what, they don't all look the same. In, in everywhere. So for example, uh, this is a state where I don't have to fight with my boss to take the work seriously. And I'm grateful for that because people who have my job in other states, they have to fight every day just for legitimacy in their work. Uh, it really honestly depends the political atmosphere and who lives in the jurisdiction can have a big impact on how seriously the work gets taken. So there are lots of jobs like mine around the country at the local level and the state level, um, but not all of us have the same resources or credibility or support. Uh, my other question is that uh, I get that your job, I mean, you're fighting for people, but do you feel like you get enough support from the community too? Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, I get a lot of support from the community and, and I'm grateful for that because, because I'm not guaranteed a job or this job and, and that's hard um, sometimes to work in government and to feel like you're part of a system and maybe the system's not working the way you like it. And I think it's very easy to get discouraged by that, but I have been very grateful that people in the community really want to see this succeed. And anytime I ask anybody for anything, they're always prepared, they're always ready, they're, they're, they're ready to do the work. And I have always appreciated that. Um, and at the same time, I also need the community to check me. You know, I'm not going to be right about everything. And sometimes it's not just about them supporting me, it's about me making sure that I'm supporting them however they need, not just however the state feels like it. So it's definitely a two-way street and um, I, I, have to be, I have to be accountable to the community in the same way that I expect to be supported by them. Uh, for your job, uh, what was the process like to get the job and when did you start thinking of it? Can you say that again a little bit louder? When, when did you start thinking about the job? What was the process like? When did I first what the job? I'm so sorry. Thinking about it. Planning of getting the job. All right, one more time, one more time. <laughs> <laughs> like you can ask when did you apply for the job? 
Yeah. And when, well, you, when you, you know, it's the process, it. like to get the job, is that what you're asking? Yes. 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 What was the Say process? What was the process? Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I got to turn up my volume. This is me. Okay. Um, <laughs> you know, oh, it's not it this. was. Yeah. So. Wait, hold on. Pause for a second. Philip, just ask. The sorry. Question. Oh. Ask the question again. You don't need that. It's just the computer. So, uh, what was the process like to get the job? Mm. Yeah. So, I think I. So, I think it was twenty. I don't know. Twenty seventeen. Twenty eighteen. I guess that um, I was in New York, and I guess. I guess I had decided to start looking at Vermont and and I was I noticed a headline oh they passed a bill to create a racial equity something something and I thought oh that's interesting and I didn't really think a lot about it and then a few months later um, I got an email and it was just a generic email of all these jobs in Vermont and and this one came up and I said oh man they're going to get all kinds of great people from around the country. It's not worth me applying. Why bother? But I said, you know what? Why not? I'll just take a chance. And, and I applied for it. And then they called me for an interview. And I remember thinking to myself, okay, I'm going to fly. I'm going to fly to Vermont interview. And I said, but I know they're not going to give me the job. So I'm not going to pay actual money for this flight because I'm not going to spend money on a job I'm not going to get. So I actually bought my flight with points. <laughs> and, and it was February. So let me see, I applied in December, 2018, and they called me in February to show up the following week. So I got on a plane and I came to Burlington and it was so cold. And, and I interviewed three times, one in February, one in April, and then once in May, um, right? Yeah, February was with the advisory panel. I think April was with secretary of, of administration. And then the third one was with the governor in his office. Um, and then in June, they made the offer. And in July, I was here. Wow. So do you currently live in New York or in Burlington? Um, like, you said, do I, do I live in New York or Burlington? Yeah, did, like, did the job uh, make you move to Vermont since it's like a Vermont thing? Or do you stay, did you stay in New York? No, so I, I knew I was going to come to Vermont anyway, and that's why I started looking at jobs here. So I was just waiting for the right opportunity, and this was it. So as soon as I got the offer, I just packed up and moved, and um, so I'm, I'm in Vermont. Oh, sweet. That worked out well for you then? Well, let's see. I mean, you know, <laughs> you, you know what's interesting? A lot of people don't know, but my job technically expires in 2024. Oh. oh no. <laughs> no question. Because all racism before. <laughs> so like when they expire, does another person take over or like people vote for you to stay? Is that how that works? So, yeah, so what they tell me is that it's most likely that they're just gonna keep extending it forever because they do that with a lot of positions and committees. Um but you know we also, this is also a political world, unfortunately. And so just because the job is here for years doesn't mean I am. I mean, you know, the administration could change. You could have new people in leadership tomorrow. And if that's the case, then nothing is guaranteed. But that's the reason that I think it's so important to do this work because if you set up strong policy today, then it doesn't matter who comes next, who gets elected, who doesn't get elected, people are still going to be looked out for regardless if you put strong policies in place today. So I'm really just focused, focused on now. Focus on now, let's see. Um, one of the other things that we were curious about was uh, the... Uh, do we have photos? Yeah, I don't think this is it. But the, the budget for yeah. school. Yeah, you can start if you want. Yeah. The, uh, I, I guess, like, do you know anything about that? Like, does that have anything to do with you and your work, workforce for like the budget for school to like from now to 2023? About the, wait, do I know anything about what now with the workforce? The budget for school, the Burlington budget 
Let's go by there. No. No, unless unless I'm misunderstanding. Well, okay, I guess I guess what I mean is like, uh, what is like, how does your job impact schools? Oh yeah, um, it's hard with schools because one thing that Vermont loves is local control, right? Where the state can only tell school districts what to do, um, so much, right? And so. A lot of what we want to do at the at the local level in schools, we actually can't make the schools do it. And so the challenge is working with the district to say, okay, this is why it's important for you to do X, Y, Z, or for you to stop doing X, Y, Z. We can help you get there. We can give you a model policy. We can try to give you some funding. But at the end of the day, it really takes a local action to get a lot of things done or to put certain protections in place. And that's one of the reasons that I was telling you about that uh, pilot program that we want to roll out at the municipal level, because we want, I, I want to have answers for people, but some of the answers are legally just outside our hands. Um, and some of it has to come from, from local people. So like sports teams, athletic teams, right? Um, students getting harassed or bullied or subjected to racist slurs, right? Those are the kinds of things that when we read about them, when I read about them, I get livid and want to intervene and want to do something. And then I'm reminded of the fact that, well, legally, there's not a whole lot you can do. And, and, and that's hard, right? Because you have a separation of, of powers in government for a reason, because you don't want any one part of government to have too much power or to abuse it. Um, so it can be a really good thing. But there's also circumstances where it just ties your hands and that's it's difficult to accept that's okay anybody else uh yeah um like if you have an issue in your job how do you address it like if it's a big issue mm. well so far luckily i haven't had too many big issues um so that's a good thing but I guess it depends on what kind of issue. Like for example, um, if I'm having a problem with the way that my colleagues are treating me, then um, you know there's a process for that. You can go to human resources or you can go, I could go to my boss. Um, if I really needed to, I suppose I could go to the governor. Um, but you know, if I'm having a problem with, um, I don't know, not, not being listened to on a policy or something that I believe in, um, maybe it's about the vaccination policy or whatever it is, then I have a lot of options. For example, if I disagree with something we're doing and it's health related, I'm going to talk to my colleagues in the health department and say, hey, this is what I think. And actually, this has happened multiple times. For example, when we were rolling out testing and when we were rolling out vaccination, um, I had some strong thoughts that weren't reflected in the policy. And I went to the commissioner of health, Dr. Levine, and said, hey, I have some concerns. This is what I know. This is what I've seen. This is the science that I've seen. What can we do to reconcile this for communities of color? And he said, let me think on it. And then he came back and said, we can find a middle ground. Um, so when that works, it works great. I have not yet had the kind of problem that couldn't be resolved. Um, and you know, one good thing is sometimes if I have an issue, I may not always be the one who needs to speak up about it. Um, I have seen other people notice when I'm being uh, treated not so great and they will just loudly step up and say something where I don't have to. And it's also good to know that you have people around you who are willing to do that. Um, and you also have to be willing to, to turn around and do that for others when you see it. So. Yeah. Um, did you have like a lot of struggles when you got the position? Like uh, due to like moving and uh, trying to understand the community better? Housing is really hard in Vermont. I'm gonna just say that. <laughs> Housing is rough here. So um, 
that that has definitely been a challenge. But I think another big challenge is that in Vermont, people really see you as an outsider if you haven't been here for 19 generations. And so they treat you differently and they treat you like you're not a real part of the community. And so I think one of the challenges, not everybody, of course, lots and lots of people are very welcoming. And you know, I have to acknowledge that, but, um, but there is a little bit of a challenge with people who don't take you seriously because you're from somewhere else. And um, yeah, there's that. I mean, also the other thing is that I'm used to a more urban environment. So when, when I think about government, I think about um, more people doing more jobs, but here it's a lot fewer people. So um, I'll give you an example. When I, was, I, I, I first got here and I met with um, somebody from the legislature, I don't remember who it was, but you know, a lawmaker. And the person said, we should meet. And I said, yeah, great. What's your scheduler's name? Let me reach out to your scheduler. And the person said, I don't have a scheduler. And I said, oh, maybe your special assistant or your body person or your communications person. And they were like, I don't have any of that. I do all my own work. We don't get staff. And I remember thinking that was so different from New York. Like everybody has a team of people. And, and here in Vermont, it's like every, everybody wears a lot of different hats, which I like, actually. I think that it's, um, it's good. It means that the people who are in the room have to know what's going on because that's the reason you're in the room. Um, yeah, so I think just understanding how government works here was a little bit different because everything is, is a little smaller. Uh, my other question is that, like, since you said that you're just like working with people, like in a community, if you like, I was wondering like if you talk about like going like in different school in the community to talk to students about your job or something like that? Yeah, you know, um, I think working in the community is the most important thing. And sometimes when you, when you move to government positions, sometimes you forget that. Um, or if you've always been in government positions, maybe you never learned it. And, and, and it means you're disconnected. Um, so, so you're talking about, and I've had the, the honor of being able to sit with students from, you know, middle school to high school to college and to law school. Um, and I don't really see a big difference, to be honest. I think for all of the student groups I've ever interacted with, there's a real feeling of readiness and understanding and just I don't know what it is, but it's like, they get it. They just get it. And, and, and they don't, they don't play around with it. They don't try to like, I'm doing a very bad job of explaining this, but I've always, I'm just, I'm always impressed um, when I'm with, when I'm with students of any age, especially a couple weeks ago, I was uh, at a middle school, high school giving a talk. And I feel like those kids were more mature than me <laughs> and um, and they got it. They understood, we talked a lot about systemic racism and it was just, I just see that as a huge part of the community. And as a matter of fact, in Vermont, you know, the most racially diverse people in Vermont are the younger people, statistically speaking, that's not even just casual observation, it's just data, right? And so when, when we think about racial equity, um, I always tell people we have to, we have to do racial equity and generational equity because those, those two things go together, right? If you're looking for people of color in Vermont, they're gonna be younger. And if you're serving young people in Vermont, they're more likely to be of color. So, you know, that's the next generation of graduates and home buyers and new professionals in the workplace. And if we care about housing and employment and young children, um, then you have to think about the people who are gonna be starting that world. I don't know if I answered the question. Yeah, that's good. Do you think that um, racial equity problems have been like, uh, most of them have been solved or just like 
still the same as last year. Mm. If you understand the question. I feel like a lot of it is the same and a lot of it is very new, you know? Some some of the conversations that I have with people, I feel like I've been telling them the same thing for two years. Um, but but I also just feel, a, I also see a lot of forward movement, you know, people doing things differently now than, than they used to be. And, you know, again, part of it is because when you have um, a legislature that comes from the community, you have more people, again, more community activists who can participate. And I think that that helps to change the shape of things. Um, so I don't know, Some, sometimes it feels like we're not moving fast. And other times I look and I feel very proud of, of how far we've come. And it's hard to put a, a finger on it, but um, you know, it's, it's just like with everything, right? Like some of, when it's good, it's really good. And when it's not, it's really not. Uh, like what like what Bonnie asked about like uh, if you guys like uh, make any change as us not what would, like uh, let me see how that if you guys actually saw what would that look like right right, yeah. right, 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 right. what would you said what would real change look like? Yeah. Real change would look like us not needing my job anymore. Uh, yeah. <laughs> when we don't need a racial equity director anymore then i'm gonna be so happy because it means we did what we needed to do well, I now guess, uh... if, I'm being, if i'm being a little bit more realistic then i would say real change means that when people come to me it's not because of a crisis we have to respond to. It's because we're being proactive on the front end on equity, right? It also means that when we say, oh, hey, we want to do this program related to racial equity, I don't get a response that says, well, we'll have to figure out where we're going to pull that money from or what we're going to take away from. Because when you phrase it like that, it's, it's coming from a scarcity mindset, right? It, it, it implies that equity work is taking away from other work, real work, as opposed to saying, when you do something from an equity perspective, it's benefiting everybody. And that is the underlying perspective that all the work should have. So instead of talking about it as if it's taking away from something else, recognize it as an addition, not a subtraction. That's how I see real change is when we start recognizing we're not just spending we're investing, and that there's a real key difference there. Okay. Um. Yeah. Oh yeah. In order, uh, we are about to wrap up. And do you have any questions for us before we finish? One more time. Okay. Uh, sorry. Um, before we finish our meeting, do you have any questions for us? Do I have it? I'm. I'm so sorry. One more time. <laughs> okay. I'm just gonna speak as loud as I can. Yeah, um, you gotta yell. At okay, you. so before we finish our meeting, does, do you have any questions that you want to ask us? Yeah, I do actually. How are you doing? Uh, uh, all right. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of cold outside. Yeah, it is. It's very cold. So cold. I hate it. Well, maybe you all could tell me a little bit about. Um, what drew you to the program and what what have you gotten out of it so far and what do you hope to get out of it? Jeremiah? The program? Uh, sure. Um, I When I first joined this program was because I was hearing things about cameras and videos and stuff and that interested me. But since joining, it's been a little bit different than that. We, I, I mean, we have gotten a lot of chances, all of us to talk to a lot of different people that have like, different knowledges and experience and so we've been learning from them pretty much and i think that's really cool and also we get to use cameras around after all so that's also cool oh yeah um what jeremiah said uh what drew me into this was the cameras and uh i was pretty shy in front of a camera but i wanted to try a new experience and i kind of went for it <laughs> It was pretty challenging at first, but 
I kind of got the hang of it. <laughs> and now he's in front of the camera. Oh, yeah, exactly. yeah, while doing this program, just like what Jeremy and Boniface all said, just using camera and editing video, but even actually much better, like we get to interview people, I actually thought we'll do that. It was a nice experience, I guess. Yeah, I think the program is pretty cool, interviewing different people and learning how to use the cameras is pretty cool. Yeah. It's kind of like we get to experience a city experience through the computer, which is... <laughs> I'm <laughs> telling <laughs> different people every day. Yeah. Yeah. Listen, we have to appreciate being able to interview each other like this because in another few years, the robots are going to be interviewing us and we won't be talking to people anymore. <laughs> the robots are coming. What is Elon Musk doing? <laughs> well, thank you very much for your time. Yeah, we appreciate this conversation. It was awesome. And also nice to meet you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. This has been so great. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Have a good one.